لن نقول هنا لندن وإنما بالقرب منها هنا في أكسفورد وجامعتها العريقة مركز للأبحاث متخصص بتاريخ الفن الإسلامي وهناك في جامعة لندن وتحديدا في كلية الدراسات الشرقية والإفريقية كرسي لدراسة هذا الفن يقابلها بروناي جاليري هذه إنجازات علمية وعملية للبروفيسور ناصر خليلي الذي يمتلك أكبر مجموعة خاصة من كنوز الفن الإسلامي تضاهي المجموعة العثمانية ومجموعة متحف القاهرة وتزيد عن عشرين ألف قطعة تمثل حقبات تاريخية ومدارس فنية ازدهرت على مر القرون فمن هو لبروفيسور ناصر خليلي الإيراني المولد البريطاني الجنسية وماذا يريد أن يقول؟ بروفيسور خليلي حدثنا عن الطفولة عن النشأة عن بداية الهواية في جامع التحف الفنية The dream of mine from at the age of five was one day to be a collector Later on we created the Khalili Family Trust to be able to use the finances of it to fulfill our dream كيف تكونت لديكم الرغبة في جمع التحف الأثرية Correct. I used to walk to school at the age of uh, seven, and uh, the distance between our house and the school was something like an hour. And uh, I didn't mind. Uh, even now, I walk everywhere. So um, I walked to school early in the morning, and I was coming back home at about five in the afternoon. Obviously, I had to have lunch in between. So uh, my parents, God bless their souls, uh, gave me a certain amount of money that uh, I was supposed to use. To buy my lunch, but every day I used to come home very hungry, and most of the time my parents were not home because they were involved in all sorts of charities. So I used to cook for myself. So once my mother asked me, "Son, how come you come home so hungry? We'll give you money to uh, have uh, lunch when you're at school." Uh, and I said, uh, "I have to confess that um, not always I use that money to buy lunch." And they said to me, then what do you do with it? I said, I'll buy and collect stamps. Professor Khalili, من أين أتى اهتمامك بالفنون? Because I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to be born in a family of collectors and dealers, from the very early age, I was introduced to all type of art. Well, it was about 30 years ago. Um, I was actually helping a friend of mine run a jewelry shop in Bond Street and uh, David came in. He was commuting from the States backwards and forwards and he was extremely charming as usual and uh, we started to talk and uh, it was instantly we had a chemistry and uh, the rest is history and that was 30 years ago. Professor Cleely has had an enormous impact on Western perception of Islamic art not only through the setting up of his chair, the Cleely Chair in Islamic Art, but also through uh, enabling us to build the Brunei uh, Gallery, because that's been enabled us to show Islamic art to the public, as well as having lectures, events, and things about Islamic art. So he's had an enormous impact on, he's actually made people see Islamic art through new eyes. And now you'll find that there are Islamic art collectors, there are people who are interested, who's followed what has been pioneering footsteps by Professor Cleely. الدكتور خليلي كان له دور هام جدا في تاسيس آه هذا المبنى اللي بفضل اتصالاته بسلطان بروناي اللي هو آه بنى هذا المبنى او كمان مول بناء هذا المبنى وهذا المبنى اللي هو كمان مركز الـ الـ الخليلي تشير الكرسي لتدريس الفن الاسلامي هنا في, في جامعه سواس well, we, uh, in, in SOAS, we have three members of staff who are specialists in Islamic art and archaeology. So we cover all different periods. So the most recent book that the professor of Islamic art has published, I have here, which is on Cairo of the Mamluks. Um, and then we also have people who've done work, for example, in Abu Dhabi about the archaeology of the Abu Dhabi islands. We have people, done people who've done basically all ranges of Islamic art, all periods, all times. So it's not that we focus on a particular area, but we try and make sure that we cover all areas, whether also whether it's architecture or books, graphic art, all, all sorts of art. 
It does, does very much so, as it allows, we've got, um, as all of the exhibitions that we run here, all relate and by, by subject and regions to, the, uh, to those studied by the school. So for our own students, it means that if, if, they're, are study, if, if they're studying Middle Eastern and Islamic art, it means not, they're not only getting to read about these, but they get to see the actual objects themselves and experience those. Uh, we've also been fortunate enough to be able to digitise um, selected manuscripts. Um, and in doing that, we've allowed the students to have even more access to uh, original material, which they just wouldn't get anywhere else in the world. This centre has provided us with a unique opportunity to be all together, to have lectures and be inspired by each other's research and come out of the isolation of a PhD research, which really is just on your own topic. And um, I find um, this, the possibility absolutely enriching. And uh, it has given me the possibility to also share my research with other students mm -hmm. and my colleagues uh, here. And my um, aim is to work in Mexico as a curator and lecturer of Islamic art because my topic is the transfer of technique from um, Spain, Iraq, Spain, to the modern world, mm -hmm. uh, to the new world, and that is in Mexico. And For a long time, David Khalili has been a friend of Islamic art and archaeology in Oxford. Um, he's been a very close collaborator and colleague with myself and with predecessor here, um, Dr. Julian Raby, who's now at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And also, he, uh, David Khalili, has uh, supported um, research fellowships here in Islamic art and archaeology in the past. And so we've been talking to him for a long time and suggesting that it might be possible to develop such a center. And five years ago, he generously gave us the benefaction that made it possible to set this up. أهلا بك مجددا بروفيسور خليلي لديك خمس مجموعات فنية الأكبر هي المجموعة الإسلامية التي تتكون من عشرين ألف قطعة ومن ثم المجموعة اليابانية مجموعة المطعمات بالميناء والذهب من مختلف أنحاء العالم ومجموعة المجموعة الإسكندنافية والمجموعة الإسبانية هل لك أن تحدثنا عن هذه المجموعات وعن كيفية اقتنائها؟ In the course of collecting the Islamic collection, which began in 1970, I was introduced simultaneously to other cultures, namely Japanese art of major period in Japan, the art of textile in Sweden, Spanish art in Spain of the 19th century. And in Amel of the World, because I start to buy Fabergé, which is a household name when it comes to enamel. Obviously, there are other enamel makers from different centers of the world, and that is the title of our enamel collection, called Enamels of the World. And this is the exhibition that we are uh, uh, planning to do on 8th of uh, December in uh, a state Hermitage, in, in, state, in, in Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Uh, but being in love with art, being in love with beautiful uh, objects doesn't stop you to only collect in one area. And if you have the ability and the love and the passion, and if you treat every child the same way, and this is how I did, I treated, I treated every single collection exactly the same as, an, as I treat my family and my close friends. So I did the same, I gave them the same treatment. And that's how we manage to give the same sort of uh, uh, treatment to every collection, and we ended up to have five comprehensive collections that in, in their own way would fill a void in the collecting activities of the world. He has two, two families. Okay, so um, we are the biological family, and then he has his art collections, which are his honorary family. So, um, and I hope, I hope he has the energy forever um, to collect and to, to create what his passion is for a long, long time. متعب كتير عأساس الشغل متعب مش ناس الخليل المتعب الشغل معه هين كتير لأنه بيوثق فينا مية بالمية فبيعطينا حرية نشتغل شغلنا مثل ما لازم نشتغله. During the period of uh, collecting Islamic art, uh, I was introduced uh, to um, uh, Japanese art of the Meiji period. Uh, it goes back to um, 
uh, Meiji Emperor who ruled from uh, 1868 to 1912, 44 years. In actual fact, uh, the movie The Last Samurai was the history of uh, the life of the Meiji uh, uh, Emperor. Um, I was introduced to the, to, 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 the, to the art and I realized that uh, uh, like Islamic art that I collect, uh, it does have a tremendous potential. Uh, it is an art that can never be reproduced again. And it is one of the, the greatest uh, art that has been produced during the 19th century. So I took it upon myself to do a bit more study. And uh, the result was that we have created the largest collection of Meiji art in the world. It is a unique collection and it is a unique reminder to our people of our own heritage, uh, which has uh, played an important part in uh, bringing forward the process of fusion between our own culture and the Western culture. كيف تتم العناية بالمقتنيات التي تجمعونها وما هي التقنيات المستعملة لحفظها ولترميمها؟ uh, obviously, we have given uh, many exhibitions around the world, over 35 exhibitions, and we have given loan to more than 50 museums and institutions around the world. But for every single piece, in every collection that we hold, every piece has its own place in its own box or in its own uh, uh, location. So let's assume that we are uh, 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 transporting some of the glass in the Islamic collection. So there is a, a special box with a coded color because we have our own color of, of museums and galleries, which is dark blue. So every object has its own place, like it has its own bed to sleep in. Every photograph is taken for every object which is outside of the crate to tell you the accession number, the photograph of the object, and uh, 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 the, 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 the sort of a allocation of the object. So every object, the, the very virtually the entire 25,000 pieces that we hold in the five collections has its own place. And then they are held in different locations. Those, which, those are the, the ones that are uh, in the different locations and are away from uh, being, uh, uh, being looked at again are the pieces that we have finished with. Namely, they have been photographed, they have been restored, they have been published, and they have some of them been exhibited. For the other objects that we need to bring in to do more conservation, we have other areas which we call the research center and conservation center where we, where, whereby we, we write our books. So the objects come to the center, they have their period of conservation, research, photography, and everything else we need to do with them. And once we finish with them, they go back home to the warehouse of a choice that we have for each collection individually. هل لك أن تعطينا فكرة عن أصعب قطعة تم ترميمها وحفظها وعلى سبيل المثال من المجموعة الفن الإسلامي؟ Going back to uh, conservation, uh, Qurans, for, for instance, and out of the book and manuscripts is the area that needs a lot of attention because uh, a lot of these Qurans that we have in our collection a lot have of this approximately 500 Qurans and probably uh, the entire collection of our rare books and manuscripts and Qurans comes to about 800. Uh, they don't come to us the way that you see them. Uh, we receive them sometimes. They need uh, uh, paper preservation. They need the binding to be changed because otherwise the edges would break. They need the acidification, so we have to send them to the museum sometime and sometime to the real expert to wash every single pa uh, page and get uh, the, 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 the acid that accumulates throughout uh, the years out of every page. So, and then we'll treat them with a very reversible special chemical, which is vegeta vegetarian chemical. We never use anything, any chemical, which is uh, chemically not, vege uh, not vegetarian mm -hmm. because of the nature of the, of, of the holy Qurans or any manuscript we have. But everything that we do is reversible anyhow. So we, we, we wash them especially and then we treat them especially that for the next two, three hundred years, it would stay the way we finish with them. اعتمادا على مجموعاتكم الفنية أصدرتم أهم موسوعة للفن الإسلامي والعمارة الإسلامية تغطي العالم الإسلامي بالكامل فما أهمية هذا العمل الذي ترجمتموه لعدة لغات؟ Between the five collections we have published 50 volumes 
It is the largest art publication of one collector to date. And at the same time, I have to tell you that so far, we have done approximately 85% of the publication, which is about 37, 38 volumes. So within the next two years, we'll finish our entire publication. And for that matter, the Islamic publication, which is about 28 volumes, would be the last word and the best encyclopedia of Islamic art in its generality ever produced. But it is a, a fantastic uh, uh, book that David has produced. Uh, it's a tribute to his own painstaking work in assembling his collection and the great team that he has that, that does it. It's a tribute to his own commitments to the cause of education and culture that he's produced this book. And it will be an immensely valuable resource for students, for general readers, for those who have a, a deep knowledge of Islamic art and architecture, and indeed for those like myself who, who, who don't and who are regarding it as a, as, a, as a remarkable learning experience. I'm often asked, what is Islamic art? The term Islamic art broadly describes work produced by Muslim artists for Muslim patrons. It does not imply that the art is exclusively religion, religious in content or use. It is Islamic because its artistic vocabulary is partly rooted in the Muslim philosophy and shaped to some extent by the spirit and doctrine of the Muslim faith. فعلا هي مش مجموعة فقط لكن هي مجموعة والمنشورات اللي تبعها واللي بتو بتقدم المعلومات عنها والبحث عنها هو عبارة عن أكاديمية للبحث ال 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 الأشياء الفنية أو الأعمال الفنية كلها اللي إحنا بنشوف جزء منها هنا مش فقط ال ال الاقتناء ومش فقط العرض ولكن البحث والنشر ده مهم جدا وده اللي اللي جعل إن عمل دكتور خليل عمل ثقافي جبار. As, as you know, I'm the student of uh, Lama University. I studied, I did my PhD in Lama University. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, after, after, give, after getting my PhD, they wanted me to go on a, a court of government body. So I became a governor. And uh, I served for about uh, 17 years. Mm -hmm. So I became uh, the longest uh, serving uh, uh, governor in the history of uh, university. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my time, we have done a lot for the university. We, um, uh, established uh, the first chair of Islamic art uh, in any university in the world, uh, called the uh, Halili Chair of Islamic Art. Uh, we raised, uh, I raised money, uh, uh, 10 million pounds, uh, through uh, the King of Brunei, who was a close friend of mine, and the city is a friend of mine, to uh, build the Brunei Gallery. لقد اتركنا في ابوظبي مبكرا الدور الكبير الذي يمكن ان تلعبه الثقافه والفنون في تطور المجتمع والفرد وفتح افاق للتواصل والتقارب بين مختلف الثقافات والشعوب. لذا فقد قامت حكومه ابوظبي وفقا لتوجيهات صاحب السمو الشيخ خليفه بن زايد ال نهيان رئيس الدوله وحاكم ابوظبي حفظه الله ومتابعه الفريق أول سمو الشيخ محمد بن زايد آل نهيان ولي عهد أبو ظبي ونائب القائد الأعلى للقوات المسلحة بوضع كل إمكانياتها البشرية والمادية لتحويل أبو ظبي إلى مركز للإشعاع الثقافي ليس على المستوى الإقليمي فقط بل على المستوى العالمي. المعرض فنون الإسلام يمثل بداية سلسلة من معارض اللي نحن نسميها مستوى معارض متاحف يعني هذا المعرض تم تقديم جزء منه في متاحف في سيدني وفي غيرها وفي لندن لكن أكبر مجموعة عرضت من مجموعة الخليل لحد الآن هي في معرض فنون الإسلام في أبو ظبي At the end of the day the culture belongs here and people here have to see this incredible artistic and valuable artifacts for them to realize what 
their ancestors have produced, especially for young generation. So the Marad be as them the Islam from the first to the last. ومن كل النواحي في عنا مصاحف في عنا مخطوطات دينية مخطوطات أدبية في ديوان ديوان المتنبي مثلا في مخطوطات مرسومة بالتصوير مثل الشهنامة الإيرانية في خزا في في فقدمنا الفن الإسلامي من أوله لآخره عبر كل المجالات اللي معقولة يوجد فيها. So we started to show obviously with the name of Almighty Allah. This is the very rare piece of textile, it's probably unique from North Africa, which depicts the name of Almighty, repeats it line by line, but the way this was made on its own is magnificent. What they have done here is they have taken a blue silk, and a lot of people think that the name of Allah is written on it. No. All the names that you see in a row is embroidered with a silver thread on the top of a silk background. Uh, here you have one of the uh, kisbah, which was uh, used for covering uh, the Kaaba. Uh, this was a tradition which lasted for almost 500 years. Uh, from the Ottoman time, one of the earliest uh, goes back to uh, uh, late uh, 15th century. Uh, mostly given by the Ottoman rulers as a gift. And what you see here is um, a Sultan Abdul Majid, and it dates to about 1850. Uh, there are uh, a big group of these in our collection, and here we showed what we show one of them. You have a very beautiful selection of uh, uh, Quranic pages and full Qurans dating from uh, uh, late 7th, early 8th century, which is a Mayal page to uh, the continuation of it and probably the largest page from the largest Quran written in Central Asia on vellum. Uh, Quran was written on vellum in the beginning and later on when paper became available it became more favorable to the, to the calligraphers to use that. Mm -hmm. uh, here you have uh, a group of uh, Qurans. Of Mus'hafs. Uh, These are all Mus'hafs. Yeah. Absolutely, they're all Mus'hafs. And you have from a thousand years old Masaf all the way down to six, seven, eight hundred years old Masaf. Uh, the one here is uh, very special, it's from North Africa. Uh, the beauty of this is that uh, most of the Masafs only have uh, uh, the name of the calligrapher or the date or the location mm -hmm. or who did the illumination. Uh, here you have all four. And uh, it goes back to probably uh, one of the early families of Khaldun's. But from the, the point of view of the study of the external characters of, characteristics of the Quran manuscripts, um, their artistic uh, aspect, then the, uh, the Khalili collection was one of the first to start collecting them in, an, in a systematic way so that you bring together um, a body of material that covers all of uh, the, Isl the Islamic world from Morocco to China um, and also the whole period from the very beginnings of Islam up until the end of the production of um, Quran manuscripts in the 18th and 19th century. We have another Masaf, but uh, with a huge difference. Uh, this Masaf was written by the grand daughter of Shah Jahan, a daughter of Aurangzeb, who ruled India for 50 years. Uh, it's the only royal Quran that we know of which is written by women in history of Islam. So what she has done, she educated herself how to write, how to read, and probably not illuminate, because it was probably illuminated by the illuminator in the court, but, uh, uh, and she, showed, she, she, she chose to write it in Nasr, which was her favorite uh, type of uh, uh, writing. Mm -hmm. In the, uh, the Indian section, um, the South Asian section of the collection, you have, um, one Quran who was actually written by uh, the daughter of the Emperor Aurangzeb, uh, who ruled in the second half of the 17th century. And uh, his, um, his daughter, uh, Zinat al Nisa, um, like her father, was a very religious person, very pious person. And um, the collection includes this um, manuscript, which is rather beautiful, uh, which was copied by a woman and also by a member of the Indian royal family. This is probably something that is close to uh, the heart of everybody in the region. 
because this is the book that you study in school. This is uh, Divan Mutanabi. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is written, it's contemporary to his period. Uh, Divan Mutanabi obviously was written throughout the Islam from the beginning, but this is from the period when he was alive. It's not something that was uh, copied later. So this is uh, a very good uh, example of Divan Mutanabi. And here you have uh, Ibn Arabi. Uh, there are six of them known, and we have two of them in the collection. And next to it, you have a book of Ibn Sina. Again, a philosopher and a doctor. In medicine? Yes, about medicine. There are a very good group of um, astrolobes and globes in the collection. And here you have uh, one of the earliest uh, astrolobes yeah. in the world. It's 9th century. Probably there are six known in the world, and this is one of the six. Uh, this globe is very important too. Uh, for many years, uh, a copy of it was in Louvre, uh, and the original was lost till we got hold of the original. And now the original with us, but in Louvre, they decided to change the attribution, and now they're calling it 19th century. This is 13th century, and the one in Louvre is 19th century. This is the cover of the uh, our, our catalog. Uh, as it is mentioned in the catalog, it's the earliest eyewitness view of uh, Mecca known. Uh, it's dated about 1843. Uh, it was commissioned by um, uh, a member of the royal family in India. Again, uh, uh, the person who was doing the painting plus a map maker together went to uh, uh, Mecca and they spent a year doing the view of Mecca virtually stone by stone. So this is the earliest view we know. So we have an opportunity here for the first time, and this is exhibited for the first time in Abu Dhabi, we, are, we have an opportunity of seeing a map and seeing the view of, of Mecca, not the map, seeing the view of, of Mecca the way it used to be in 1843. Because the next earliest record that exists or six photographs, which was done about 50 years later. Now we are entering into the sort of a, a secular part of the exhibition. And uh, here I'm going to show you a couple of pieces. Uh, what you see here is uh, uh, an early bowl, but when you look at it, you say to yourself, uh, this is an inspiration for probably Picasso and most of the Impressionist painters, because they knew about the design and they knew about the form, and they knew about the color and the shape probably a thousand years before what you see painted on canvas, or for that matter, in the form of pottery today. Mm -hmm. uh, here you have two saddles, uh, one in gold and one in silver. Uh, the gold saddle um, uh, is uh, 13th century. There are two known in the world. One is with us, and the other one is in uh, China. Um, it's a Mongol uh, saddle, and uh, there are no assumptions made amongst academics that uh, it, would have been, it is possible that that was Chinggis Khan's saddle of the time because there is no record of others and gold was obviously very precious at the time and was only made for the rulers. So that must be, there is a probability that this saddle belonged to him. One. You have uh, here a crown which was for coronation. So uh, each time the king was being coronated, this is the crown that uh, they used. Uh, you have uh, probably, they were used as uh, not uh, earrings, but uh, maybe uh, ankle. Mm -hmm. So that was used for, for, for these are ankle, uh, pair of ankle, an anklets. So uh, that's, that's that. You have bracelet, you have necklace. You have uh, more khanjar here, and as I, as I explained, it goes from uh, 17th century to uh, uh, late 18th, early 19th century. You have archer rings back here. You have three beautiful archer rings and the necklace. And you have um, the, uh, the, the, the turban ornament, which was used for turbans. These are two of them, two examples of the turban ornaments that, that yeah. was used during the Mughal period. The other story I want to tell you is about one of the Qurans that we have in the exhibition. This Quran. Uh, is a Mamluk Quran that I bought in 1970s, early 1970s. Almost 17 years later, something happens. The Mamluk Qurans that I had, 
All the Mamluk Qurans that you see usually have two pages of illumination, illumination in the beginning, two pages of illumination at the back, and sometime in the middle. Uh, this Mamluk Quran had only one page of illumination, and the other one was missing. We were just about to publish it, and I received a telephone call again to go and look at some uh, uh, calligraphy and illumination. As I was going through them, and this is 14 years later, almost 14 years later, I realized a illumination amongst the pieces that I was looking at. So I told my dealer, I said, you know something? I'm almost sure this is a missing page from the Mamluk Quran that I have. He looked at me and he said, what do you mean? What you're telling me is like finding a needle in a haystack. I said, you know something? Everything in life is possible. So I took the piece, went back to my research center. I took the Quran out. And that's the shoe. It did belong. So we joined them. And you see now a complete Quran, rather than a Quran with the missing page of illumination in the exhibition. فعلا ان 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 يكون في حد بيجمع وهو حاليا مقيم في لندن فن اسلامي من العالم العالم الاسلامي اجمعهم وبينشروا وبيذيع او بينشر المعلومات وبيقيم المعارض وبيثير الانتباه طبعا دي رابطه هامه جدا بين الشعوب وبين الشرق وبين الغرب وبين الشعوب الشرقيه بينها وبين نفسها دكتور خليلي ماذا تتوقع عندما تعرض هذه المجموعة النادرة من الفن الإسلامي في الغرب؟ You see what is important about showing this collection in the West is twofold. First of all, the Western population were not really familiar with the type of culture Islam has produced. They mostly were thinking of politics. For them, each time I lecture anywhere around the world, or each, each time we had the exhibition on display, they just couldn't understand how important, how beautiful the culture of Islam is. And by looking at it, by reading the history of it, they have realized that it's not only important because it is Islamic. It's important because it is beautiful art, period. And then they realized that the culture of Islam has in many ways contributed to the betterment of the life of the West. So in reality, it opens the eyes of the Western, Westerners to the fact that they do owe a favor to the culture of Islam and its contribution to the West. I, th I think over recent years there's been a huge change in the perception of, of the Islamic world in the West and people have realized what was happening in earlier periods that they simply didn't know about before. So they know about things like Cordoba in Spain, they know about the development of the Mamluks. They didn't know about that before. They didn't realize what sort of great works of architecture were being created, what sort of great works of art. So I think it's changed people's perceptions of what the development of art has been in the world. كيف ترى الدور المستقبلي لأبو ظبي في التقريب بين الغرب والشرق من خلال الثقافة والفن؟ You know one of the things that really surprises me uh, and flabbergasted me was that uh, I realized I didn't realize as much I read a lot about what Abu Dhabi was doing till I got here and when I got here I realized that uh, the task that they took upon themselves is a mammoth task but they are doing an incredible job. In a very short time, they know their direction, they know their responsibility, and by creating probably one of the greatest cultural hubs in the world, by bringing other nations and other museums to participate with them, very soon you will have a South Thailand to become a center for culture and not only for culture that belongs to yourself. But you are bringing the culture of the world because at the end of the day, art is timeless and culture is universal. They have taken a lot from their father. Um, my eldest son, Daniel, is highly creative. He loves art. Um, he likes uh, contemporary art quite a lot. 
uh, Raphael uh, is more into the um, uh, antiquities and Japanese. Raphael loves the Japanese art and Benjamin is both. I've always loved jewellery since I was 10 years old. I mean, I was fascinated with my mother's jewellery, with, you know, always women's jewellery, men's jewellery. I always, I always used to wear a lot. And um, as I grew up, I, I fell in love with calligraphy. I mean, so I thought, how can I join the two together? So I started engraving stones with, with these calligraphies that I saw. And you can have, find many, many kinds of beautiful calligraphies. From ancient to the present day, you have, you know, all these fantastic people. And uh, just, I think that's from my upbringing, being surrounded by all this beautiful art and the creativeness and this just beauty of craftsmanship from a young age. I think that's the inspiration that I've had from a young age. And I think that's where my artist life comes from. Okay. Never. Always Not exciting. At Not at all. Always. It's something which, because it's so vast, because there's so much to learn, we learn every day. We see something new every day. You know, antiquities my father buys, Islamic art, because it's so broad and it covers so many continents and it's everywhere, there's, there's so much to learn still to this day. And my dad is learning still every day. Mm. It's fantastic, it really is. Professor Khalili, why do you think that the sound of culture and art is the best today? I've realized that uh, religion and politics have their own language. But the language of art is universal. And I don't believe that there has been a more urgency for use of that language and its universality than today. Khitaman wa atibaran bi anna al-injazat al-kabira tabda bi hulm wa hulm mubakir. Mada tansah shabab al-yawm? I would like them to keep dreaming because Everything in life that happens is a result of a dream. But they have to understand that with a dream, they have to plan and they have to pursue. Because that's the only tip, this is the only way that we can succeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Khalili. Thank you very much. And it is really an honor to be in that part of the world. Thank you. Thank you.